uh, this could by no means have happened uh, without uh, the other PIs on the project, Gil Bohr, John, Jan Idol, Mark Hebelwhite, Laura Prue, and Lee Beerling. And then um, I'll just give you a brief summary of what we plan to do for phase two. This project hasn't started yet. Um, and this is a project, um, the nickname is still at this point is Socio Socioecological Consequences of Snow and Ice Gates. And uh, the PIs on this project include myself and Todd Brinkman, who will be talking about his phase one project uh, later today, and Glenn Liston, uh, Laura Prue, and Adele Reinking. Whoops. Right, and these yellow arrows that are pointing at the wrong thing were meant to be pointing at the two species that I'm going to highlight today from this project. One, um, caribou, um, barren ground caribou, and uh, the American robin, if I have time, which reminds me to set my timer. Okay, so the overarching goal of the Animals on the Move project was to understand how highly mobile terrestrial fauna and navigate and select habitat in the rapidly changing above study domain. So um, this project was working with animal movement data set, data sets that include uh, six different species, um, and that included over 3,000 individuals. Um, and that yielded about 7 million uh, locations and that spanned a time series of uh, 20 over 25 years. Um, so how did we get data of animal movement data from six different species? Well, there are animals, as you know, roaming um, throughout the above study domain. Um, the red line is showing you the core domain, the purple, the extended parts of the above domain. Um, these green collars are just uh, showing you what uh, just representing GPS um, collars on these animals. Um, these GPS collars, some of them are equipped with uh, communication that that um, communication devices that communicate the <laughs> communicate the animals' locations periodically um, to the Argo satellite system, and then that location information is then um, downloaded to our to um, base stations and then that information is transferred directly to us so we can get information about uh, where exactly these animals are um, in near uh, real time. Um, we didn't collect uh, the majority of this location data ourselves. Um, we had an extensive network of collaborators from various government agencies in the United States and throughout Canada who were very generous um, and through a number of data sharing agreements shared a vast amount of <clears throat> location data um, with us and we were able to use this and then compare it to um, environmental data sets collected by a suite of different um, um, satellites including uh, a number of uh, NASA orbits such as uh, NASA assets such as uh, MODIS. Okay, so um, this is just a, a general representation that shows um, the wealth of data that we have had access to and are still working on quite actively. So on the x-axis here you have um, years and then on the y shows the mean locations per animal. So it just gives you an idea of in time um, and by species um, what um, the amount of data that we have. Um, and then <clears throat> Excuse me, I mentioned that we didn't collect um, the majority of this data and we didn't, but um, what we added to this that was new, um, and it's new because of um, advances in GPS technology where chips have not been um, small enough to uh, be able to be mounted on um, small birds and then also be able to have the capability of community communicating with. Um, the Argo satellite system. We also attach them to um, American robins. So the space robin is our is our mascot here, and we were able to track the migration of 44 um, space robins, as we called them. So we added that um, completely new data set um, to this movement. 
data set. So this shows the, these maps here just broadly show you the density of animals um, throughout the study domains in the upper right, and then um, broken down by um, uh, different species in the, in the, in the maps. Um, and then here we have a, just a list of all those different government agencies and also private organizations who are very generous in sharing their data with us. Okay, so um, the first uh, study that I wanted to highlight is um, some work that's just emerging. This is um, in review right now. This is a study that was led by a, a former uh, postdoc and now a research scientist at University of Maryland, um, Eliezer or Eli Garari. And he uh, was asking a, a pretty big question, um, what environmental variables impact the timing of spring migration of bear and ground caribou across northern North America? So Ellie took on all of the caribou data that we have. So here, that, um, so here each of these colors is showing you one of seven herds um, across the continent. So um, these, this is, these are the seven herds for which we had location or movement data for. Um, and you can see they span a really large um, spatial domain. Um, this included over a thousand different individuals and um, um, this time series went from 1995 to almost to, to present day. Um, again, Ellie was trying to understand what was controlling uh, the uh, timing of migration. So when these animals are leaving their overwintering ground, so the southern more, most extent of where you see these colors, and um, then what controlled their rate of migration, and then when they would arrive on their northern breeding, breeding grounds. Um, so he uh, looked to environmental variables. He looked at large-scale climate indices. He looked at local weather conditions from various sources. He looked at snow water equivalent, snow, uh, timing and snow melt, so basically snow disappearance date, um, and also uh, vegetation conditions. And what he found, much to his surprise, this was not something that he had um, thought to look for. Um, who would have thought that? Um, but what he found in looking for the environmental cues was um, a high level of synchrony across, across herds in their departure timing, uh, but not in their arrival dates. The arrival dates were um, unsynchronized. So this graph is showing you just that. So if you look um, at this graph on the x-axis, you have years from 2001 to 2017. And then on the y-axis, you have dates from uh, April through June. And then each one of the different colored time series is showing you uh, a different caribou herd. So just focus on the bottom set, and those are the departure times. So this is the onset of spring migration from overwintering grounds. And what you'll see is that, yeah, there's some noise um, you know, in a given year. But what you'll see is that when there's a big um, late year or a strong early year, um, it seems that all the herds are doing that um, um, at around the same time. So look at 2010, for example, and compare it to 29, 2009. So in 2009, all the herds across the entire continent seem to be um, uh, starting their migration at a relatively average time. And in 2010, across the entire continent, everybody starts early. Look at 2013 and then look at 2014. Um, especially in 20, you see that in 2013, um, there's an overall um, late start and then in 2014, um, an overall early start. The arrival dates are not like that, they're much uh, noisier. Um, and then if you uh, look at this movie, uh, you can see, uh, first of all, this range-wide uh, synchrony. So this top one is just gonna show you 2013, and it's gonna start in February. So first you'll see them milling around, and then you'll start, and then you'll see um, them all take off around the same time. So this is just 2013. One sec. 
All right. They're still milling around April. Oh, watch. Holy crap. Yeah, right? Holy crap is right. Now, um, now look at 2013. Now you can look at 2014 underneath. So just watch 2014 for now. Um, so now that you've gotten a little bit used to looking at this, try to watch 2013 and 2014 together and you'll see what you see in the graph that 2014 you see this delay in the onset. So this comparison here is just showing these two things. One, this crazy, really high level of synchrony across the herds, across this entire continent at these high northern latitudes. These seven herds are um, responding in the same way to something. And um, also there's this interannual uh, variability that we see in the movement data. Okay. Um, so. Um, he looked at the cross correlation coefficients and he, when he looked across the entire herds, across all, across all the herds, across, um, across the entire time series, he found a cross correlation coefficient that was pretty high, about 0.46. And then when he looked at just the ones in the east, um, he found cro correlation coefficients around uh, between 0.63 and 0.84. Um, and those are pretty high and, you know, yeah, okay, those are just among the ones that herds that are in the east. So um, maybe you'd say, okay, well, that's not so surprising, but I mean, that's a really large area. But even, but what's really astonishing is when he compared just the Western Arctic herds, so the herd all the way over on the far left of the screen, and then um, the Ahiak, the Beverly Ahiak herd, the herd all the way on the far right he found a cross correlation coefficient of 0.71. So these herds that are uh, two to 3,000 kilometers apart from one another are, um, are, are uh, departing, starting their migrations um, um, in response to something around the, uh, around the same time from one year to the next. So what he found was that this continental wide synchrony and departure timing was driven primarily by large scale ocean driven climate indices, which sort of makes sense, right? These are, these are large scale climate um, oscillations that are affecting um, um, continental scale um, uh, climate. Um, so he found that um, when the, when the, um, NAO or the North Atlantic Oscillation was in a positive phase that, the, um, that all these herds were uh, migrating later. And he found that when the PDO and AO were in positive phases that they were um, migrating earlier. Um, and it's um, known that in general, positive phases of the NAO were broadly associated with snowier and warmer condition, conditions during the late uh, winter. So it's not um, entirely clear why um, um, they are responding to these climate oscillations in the way that they are, but um, it could be related to the snowier and warmer conditions that are associated with, for example, the NAO is causing later migrations. But they are definitely um, related to these um, large scale climate oscillations. Um, he also found, and this was sort of counterintuitive and against the hypotheses that uh, we had, everyone thinks about when caribou are leaving and starting to migrate, um, um, it must have something to do with snow and snow melt, right? Um, or the vegetation. Um, and in fact, um, he found that that wasn't, that's not at all the case. So if you look at this graph here, it's showing snow free date on the X axis. And then it's showing um, um, date of departure or arrival on the breeding grounds farther north on the y-axis. 
Um, so on, in the background, he's showing um, white is representing um, when there's snow cover and gray is representing when it's snow free. So the vegetation is, is showing through. So I put a snowflake when it's snow cover and um, the, the tussock for when it's uh, snow free. Um, and then the dots on the bottom are showing you um, a departure, a departure location or time. And then um, the, the dots up at the top, the higher ones are always the arrival on the breeding grounds farther north. I hope that makes sense. Took me a while to absorb these plots. Um, so this is just showing for one herd, the Western Arctic herd. So what you'll see is that the majority of, um, and, and each of the different colors are a different year. Okay, so these are the means for different years. Um, so what you'll see is that um, the majority of the departures occurred during um, periods when um, there was still snow on the ground um, and the arrivals occurred when the snow was already gone. Okay, so it looks, and then if you look at um, all of these other herds, you look at all the departures, right, the lower circles, what is really striking is that these animals are all leaving their overwintering grounds when the, the, their overwintering grounds are completely snow covered. So it's not as if uh, snow cover seems to be the thing that's kicking them out of their overwintering grounds and sort of the final straw saying, you know, you better get going. Um, springtime is coming and uh, this is your cue to go. That doesn't seem to be the case at all. And this was, um, a little bit uh, surprising to us. So neither vegetation nor snow melt timing um, he found affected the departure timing for any herd. But we felt we feel that it remains unclear or it does remain unclear what the reasons are that caribou delay their migrations. And we think that this is likely in part because first of all, there are limitations to using satellite derived snow presence or absence metrics. So um, using, we use the MODIS um, snow cover products and we looked at snow disappearance state and snow, snow disappearance state. Um, these are 500 meter resolution um, products and so there may be a lot of fine scale features that uh, we're not seeing, fine scale uh, differences in snow cover that we're not seeing that are important to these animals. Um, and that might be part of the story. But there's also more to snowscapes um, than just snow cover and um, um, the snow cover products are, are not telling us about those. There's snow depth, there's hardness, um, and these things are important to wildlife. It restricts, uh, these features have to, a lot to do with locomotion and also impact their animal's ability to reach the food that they need. And in fact, we found, Ellie found in the same paper, the same study, um, some indirect evidence um, that snowpack conditions influence migration timing and speed. And so he looked at a number of environmental variables that um, um, were not that are related to the snow, and found that um, when he looked at the snow water equivalent, for example, he found that when there was a higher snow water equivalent and higher temperatures together, that the animals departed later. And we're speculating that this deep, that these deep wet under deep wet snow conditions. Um, the animals might need leave later because it's hard to walk through um, deep, heavy snow. I mean, we know that for sure. If there's deep snow, but it's light, it's not so bad. Um, if there's not deep snow, that's even better. But if it's deep and heavy, it's very hard to work through. We have to spend a lot of energy to do so. And the same um, is the case for uh, these animals. So perhaps they wait for a cold snap to refreeze um, the surface making it easier to walk over. And this is something that's supported by also some indirect um, evidence from meteorological monitoring and a caribou study um, in Eastern Canada by LaCour et al. Um, some more evidence that things other than snow cover might be playing an impact, yet making snow important to what may be playing a role in what, when these animals are leaving. 
um, um, starting their migration is wind speed. So he found that higher winds um, meant earlier arrival on the calving grounds. Um, so he found that higher wind speeds while they were migrating um, meant that the animals were arriving earlier on their calving grounds uh, higher, further north. So we know that higher, higher wind speeds lead, lead to hard, harder pack snow conditions, which means the snow pack is going to be easier to walk on. Harder snow is easier to walk on. It's also harder to forage through. So the animals are probably going to spend less time milling around and eating. So traveling faster towards their uh, breeding grounds. Okay, um, I was going to show you the American Robin thing, but my time, timing of myself didn't work out so well. And I have a feeling um, that I don't have time to do that. So I'm sorry that I'm now teasing you. And instead, I'm going to move on to tell you about my phase two project because I was asked to talk about um, what I'm going to be doing for phase two. So the phase two um, phase two project is called Sociological Consequences of Snow and Ice Capes, uh, a data model fusion approach. This project hasn't started yet. Um, um, and it's a three-year project. And I mentioned the other PIs. Um, earlier. Okay, so our goal, um, well, our, our, our first objective is to quantify past and current, sorry, it's actually past, present, and future spatial temporal dynamics in snow and ice capes um, using this data model fusion approach. Um, so this data model fusion approach in, um, brings together uh, ground observations, remote sensing observations, and submodels together to take advantage of the um, advantages of each one of those things where they can fill in for one another where there are um, weaknesses in, um, in, in one and in a place or at a time when there are uh, strengths in another. Um, so the data model fusion approach is something that um, um, Glenn Liston and, and Adele Ranking have been talking about for quite a while. Um, up in the, the top left here is an example of, um, well, the top right is showing the difference um, between, um, now I'm forgetting what the top left came from. Sorry, I think it's just um, a gridded, a gridded project product for snow water equivalent, and then the top right is um, showing the data, the data model fusion approach, showing the fine scale detail in um, snow water equivalent that it can produce, and then the bottom uh, left table is showing all the different. Um, um, physical variables that um, we are going to be producing as a result of not just the snow model um, package, but the micromet, snow assim, lake ice, soil ice, and a number of other, um, another, uh, an sorry, a number of other um, packages that we're going to be developing and using and tweaking. Um, to come up with a number of snow and ice products that we will then um, modify to come up with a suite of soci societ societally relevant environmental variables that we're calling SREVs. Um, and I'll give you an example of what one of the, these uh, SREVs might be in a minute. Okay, so we'll be developing these uh, physical vari uh, var variables and SREVs and applying them um, um, to natural resources and subsistence opportunities, uh, first of all. So the first one has to do uh, with moose in three different ways. So the first are moose surveys, uh, moose vehicle collisions, and to inform um, what the migration triggers are um, uh, for uh, moose migrations. So for uh, moose surveys and this top, um, top panel here, um, the, the top graph is showing you year and the x-axis and then day of year on, um, 
on the Y and it's showing you snow onset date. And what you see is the snow onset date varies a lot from one year to the next. Um, and this poses a problem for how um, government agencies have been doing um, surveys um, uh, of moose each year. So they typically do these surveys in the fall and they need to do them um, when there's still snow on the ground, but when the animals still have antlers on and when there's still daylight. So that's in the fall, when there's still light at high northern latitudes and when the animals still have antlers on. So that's a very short period of time. You need the antlers so that you can sex the animals. Um, and what you can see from this photograph here is that it's much easier to do these surveys um, when you have snow on the ground. That's why you need the snow on the ground. It's much harder to see the animals when you don't have snow on the ground. And so this has become um, a big problem um, for the people doing the surveys. And so um, um, this is one um, problem that we're going to be um, uh, working on to do with snow and moose. And one of the SREs we'll be developing through the physical variable and SRE development is a moose survey quality index um, that we'll, we'll develop to, um, to, let, to let these surveyors know, to give them an indication of what the minimal uh, suitable conditions are, identify them and let them know where, when, and if um, it's a good time and a good place to monitor or if they should even go out and bother. So where are good places to do this um, and when are good windows of opportunity in those locations. Um, moose vehicle collisions are something uh, and migration triggers. These both have to do with snow depth. Um, so again, a different, a different um, property of snow, not just cover, but a different property. If you look at the bottom graph, you've got year and then centimeters, so snow depth and centimeters on the Y. And again, snow depth is something that varies a lot um, at high northern latitudes from one year to the next. And the photographs on the right are there to show you that, um, it, that snow depth significantly um, affects how easy um, a moose can move through snow. And what's of what's uh, known is that moose vehicle collisions seem to go up and in winters when snow depth is quite high. And so um, one of the things we'll be doing is um, looking for relationships uh, between uh, moose vehicle collisions and snow depth um, and coming up with um, indices and war uh, warning thresholds to let um, people like Department of Transportation know when they might need to be warning travelers of times of uh, high moose collision, prob high probability of moose collision rates and so forth. And then migration triggers as well. Um, we think there might be a length of, uh, a link between snow depth, um, how easy it is to move through snow and triggers for uh, migration of moose that ultimately plays back um, into um, subsistence hunting opportunities. Okay, um, we're also going to be um, using these physical variables of uh, and snow and ice and the SREVs to inform um, winter transportation networks in terms of um, safety and trafficability. So not only on the large uh, winter road networks in northwestern Canada and Alaska, so the ice roads are an obvious one, but also the winter roads. So these roads connect uh, remote communities. There are thresholds um, <coughs> during the spring um, dur that are um, that have to be met for different sized trucks um, to travel the roads, but also for subsistence communities that um, um, use um, various trails, so snowmobiling trails, for example, that span uh, several tens of kilometers outside um, um, villages to hunt, subsistence hunt. Um, and some of these trails can't be used or most of these trails can't be used and hunting can't happen when there's not enough snow on the ground or when rivers don't have sufficient ice on them. And then finally, we'll be um, contributing um, snow and ice um, um, data from our data uh, model fusion approach to the carbon cycling and climate regulation community. We won't be developing any SREVs specifically for um, this, but we have been talking to um, the carbon cycling 
people within um, the above group and um, finding out from them what types of products they will need and how we can best supply them with the snow and ice information that will um, help them advance their understanding of the interactions between the cryosphere and uh, carbon dynamics and climate regulation. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that despite skipping a third of my talk, I still went over. I apologize. <laughs> And I'm not sure if there are any questions or time for questions. Thank you, Natalie. Do, do we have uh, any questions? Sorry, I'm in a public place and people keep saying hi to me. So if you see <laughs> me on camera, <laughs> I'm very distracted. Natalie, will you be doing any field work? with your new project? No, nope. That was, that was one of the requirements is that we don't do any field work, right? Yeah, right. Unless, unless you were part of the airborne. Yeah, no field work. All right, well, if there aren't any other questions, um, I know Natalie has a plane to catch and we have our next speaker has joined as well. So are we okay to transition, Meredith? Yeah, I think it's a good time. All right, thanks again, Natalie. Bye, sorry, Todd, I'm missing your talk. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll go ahead and briefly introduce our next speaker. Uh, it's Todd Brinkman. He's an assistant professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. He's also one of our above PIs, and he's going to be speaking about his phase one project that was looking at the effects of changing environmental conditions on access to ecosystem services in Alaska. So with that, I'll let Todd take it away. All right, can everybody see that opening slide there? And everybody can hear me okay. Thumbs up by anyone? All right. Hey, Todd, just so you know, we're seeing the next slide also. So we're seeing the presenter. Oh, okay, let me, let me fix stuff. How about now? Still seeing the presenter view. No, not, in, not on my end. I've got oh, the... Okay. Did, did it switch? It switched. Yes. Okay, here we go. Well, you first, thanks. You got mad thanks. skills, Todd. What's that? You got mad skills. Oh, I, I, <laughs> I, do, I do indeed. Thank you. All right. So thanks uh, for the invite, uh, Michael and others. Uh, today, I'm going to summarize about 10 years of research on climate-related changes in the environment that are affecting people's ability to traverse the landscape and access resources that they rely upon. Um, because this is uh, a summary of 10 years, there's a lot of collaborators, a lot of funders um, that need to be thanked. I won't spend too much time on this because I know we're limited, but I will say NASA above and NSF were were big contributors. My co-authors are down on the bottom right. But then this, uh, this lady right here is Helen Cold. She's one of my graduate students that recently finished up. And she took the lead on a lot of this stuff. So I want to I wanna certainly thank her. And then also, as you'll see in a moment, um, in my research, I often work very closely with rural communities and residents, especially hunters and fishers in those communities. So I want to give a special thanks to them and all the tribal councils that uh, kindly agreed to participate and uh, provided such wonderful knowledge and insight to all the work that I do. Um, as you will uh, see as I work through this, I'm, I'm a strong believer in co-production of knowledge where we're working closely with stakeholders on the front end to shape the research questions, sh shape the research agenda with the idea to keep a focus on uh, producing results that can immediately be used by policy decision makers and managers on the ground, in addition to trying to do science with some strong intellectual merit. The central idea be behind this co-production model is better partnerships, better outcomes. 
I think I know my audience, so I also will not spend too much time on this, but higher latitudes we're receiving are uh, warming quite a bit faster than the global rate. 17 of the last 18 years have been the warmest on record since 1880s, I guess, when we started keeping records of such things. The last five years have been the warmest. This is also the case for Alaska, where we're setting records on a regular basis, including just this spring, um, with a very early breakup. Waterfowl arrived earlier than they ever have, so we're seeing a tremendous amount of change. This is playing out in different ways on the environment. One obvious uh, change is, of course, the rapid decline in sea ice extent and thickness. But in our terrestrial environment, we're also seeing uh, permafrost thaw, rapid uh, rates of uh, erosion. Some places are drying quickly, others are becoming wetter. We're seeing shifts in the wildfire regime. And I guess the central question that I asked, uh, well, me and my colleagues asked maybe 11 years ago, is how is this changing natural environment impacting, impacting the impacting, sorry about that, the availability of ecosystem services. So when I say ecosystem services, especially in rural Alaska, what I'm really talking about is fish, wildlife, um, local subsistence resources. And this is an important question to ask, especially in Alaska, and I think this, this qualifies in Northern Canada as well, is in rural areas, um, people are just much more reliant on our local resources, um, especially just for food and nutrition. So this is a graph put out by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game Division of Subsistence. And as you scroll to the right of the graph, you can see the pounds per capita of harvest in your rural areas as compared to your ur urban areas. So in your rural areas, your opportunities for commercial foods is much lower and you just have a much tighter connection to that local environment. Um, also uh, with regards uh, to culture and cultural identity. So this is a cool set of maps that I like to share with folks and it just shows how as societies have developed um, how lands and uh, characteristics of those landscapes have shaped those cultures. So up on the top left you have uh, different cultural regions and just kind of pay attention to the polygons, the colors. In the top right you have the climatic regions and then the ecoregions in the bottom middle. And as you can see, there's just this really high correlation between the, what that landscape looks like and how those cultural regions are defined. So this close connection. So when I think of these local ecosystem services, sure, food is extremely important nutrition, but also um, it's important to pay attention to how it shapes cultural identity. So getting back to the question of how have all these climate related changes in the environment affected the availability of local ecosystem services. We asked a handful of communities to participate. And these four, this was back in 2009, showed a strong interest. Wainwright and Kaktovik on the northern part of Alaska, Venati and Fort Yukon on the interior part of Alaska. We really wanted these communities to kind of guide our research. So when we started working with them, they selected the resources that we would explore the availability of and how uh, environmental changes affecting them. So here's just an example of some. We, uh, in total, we looked at 19 different resources. And then we looked at how climate change over the last human generation has affected the availability and had these rich discussions with local community members on how availability of these resources may change over the next 30 years because of uh, climate related changes in the environment. So I talk about availability here, and when I say that, I mean something specific, and we kind of defined availability with our communities. So for a resource to be av available, I'm just using bowhead whale as an example, you have to have enough of that resource to be able to sustain a harvest. People have to be able to get out to the area that they harvest that resource, and when it comes to a migratory resource, a mobile resource, it has to be in the right place at the right time. So when I say availability, all those, those three things have to come together for that resource to truly be available to those that rely on it. In this early research, which we wrapped up in around 2013 or 14, um, here's just some of the findings. So as a biologist, what we'd normally do is make this assumption if there's plenty of the resource, 
then it's readily available to those that need it. So the traditional approach of a biologist would be just looking at, say, abundance and seasonal distribution. And during our modeling on this early project where we looked at climate change and how it's affecting availability, if we ignored access, we would have walked away from that study thinking that the majority of the resources that we assessed um, were not going to be uh, significantly affected by climate-related changes in the environment with 73% in the no change, some decreasing, some increasing. But here was the striking finding from that early work. If we accounted for access, so how environmental change is affecting people's ability to get across the landscape and access local resources, the findings changed significantly. When we incorporated how it's affecting people's ability to get out there, about half of those 19 subsistence resources that we evaluated were expected to decline over the next uh, human generation because of climate change. So I want you to keep that in mind. So that told us, and this was kind of new to us at the time, that we need to give a, uh, quite a bit more attention to this access issue. So we knew that climate related changes in the environment were affecting access, but what exactly is it about uh, these environmental changes that are affecting people? And that led us to our, our NASA above project during phase one. And the objectives of this project were to identify these specific environmental conditions that are affecting hunter travel and access, and then also try to get a better understanding of what's causing change in this area. What are the biophysical mechanisms behind the conditions that are challenging folks on the ground and, and affecting traditional harvest practices? For, the, for this study, we worked with even more communities. Our goals was just to engage six, but when we uh, invited different communities throughout interior Alaska, so this kind of hashed lines that you see on the, on the map right now is the Yukon River drainage of interior Alaska, which we defined as our study area. Uh, we invited a bunch of communities to, to participate, and about 12 said this access issue was important to them, and they wanted to explore it with us. We didn't have the resources to do it with 12, but we tried to pool a little bit more together to up our six, and we ended up working with these six, uh, these nine communities across interior Alaska. Then what we did is we uh, created a memorandum of agreement with each of these communities to tell them, you know, what we, uh, to make sure our expectations align. And then the tribal council or some representative entity in that community selected local hunters or local fishers, people that were spending a lot of time on the land, and we provided them with GPS units with cameras. And what we asked is that a few people in each of these communities that are out on the land a lot go out and document changes in the environment that are affecting their ability to travel uh, across the environment and access uh, local resources, get to their traditional hunting and fishing areas. So of course, um, they were out there taking pictures, but a picture can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So for every picture that they took, we also asked them to tell us what this picture means, how frequently we, they saw this change, how big of effect it had on them when they confronted it while they were out on the bout, out and about. So it gave us the contextual information to really understand um, the specific changes that they were running into out there and how it was affecting them. Let me give you some examples of the type of changes uh, that people were running into through this cartoon. So this is your summer snow-free landscape. Uh, a lot of folks might be accessing their traditional use areas in rural Alaska, which is off the road system by ATVs. Some of the things that they're saying is we're seeing trails be er eroded or uh, vegetation overgrowing these areas, which is blocking access. In other situations, um, they're just talking about, um, as I mentioned, this advance in shrubification. However, most, probably close to 90%, somewhere in the mid 80 percentiles uh, of communities are on major navigable rivers. So a lot of people are accessing their hunting and fishing areas by rivers. And they're talking about how they're seeing more debris in the water that they need to be careful about during seasons that they normally wouldn't see it. And they're also talking about many of the tributaries off the main channels, how they're getting shallower or narrowing and obstructing access uh, into these smaller river systems back into lakes 
and SLUs. In the winter, of course, Natalie's talk was really good leading up to this. Um, there was talk about how snow conditions adequate for snowmobile travel are coming later. They said they need somewhere around 10, 15 centimeters to get out on the land, but they need quite a bit more than that actually to smooth out the trails and facilitate safe travel uh, across their hunting areas. So snow is one thing that they need to get out there, but they're also talking about how these rivers, which many of them have to traverse or travel along during the winter are freezing up later, um, which is a big issue blocking travel on the front end. But they're also talking about how during the middle of the season, these warmer winters are causing the ice to open back up or break up uh, earlier or in unpredictable ways, which is causing some um, severe safety issues. Through this project where we're, this community-based project where hunters and local residents were helped documenting these changes, we were able to categorize all these different documentations into these categories that, they, that you see here. We put them into ice conditions, snow conditions, water levels, et cetera. And in total, after a year of this work with these nine communities, they provide us with 482 observations of environmental conditions that were affecting access. We followed up this, this kind of citizen science program with intensive interviews with many of these hunters. The reason that we also did interviews is as you can imagine, on some days, um, the conditions were so bad they just couldn't get out on the land. So they couldn't get out to document things. So these intensive interviews filled those holes. So on days that they wanted to get out, but they couldn't, what sort of conditions um, were they experiencing that were, that were stopping them from getting out and about. With this information, especially which we conducted during the interviews and on the data sheets, we could then uh, perform a vulnerability assessment. So to see how these rural communities are vulnerable to these different environmental conditions. And of all the conditions that were documented in all those categories that we used, this is a relative index. It seems that these rural communities are most vulnerable to changes in ice condition uh, and eroding landscape, which is likely related to permafrost on many areas, rapidly fluctuating dynamic water levels, vegetation, et cetera. So what we did next, being this is a NASA project, is we used the remote sensing data to kind of explore these specific conditions, um, see if there's some sort of unique spectral signature from the air of these conditions that people are running into, and then look for those signatures on other uh, parts of the landscape. So we can get past to just what's happening here and now and try to identify if there's longer term trends in changes in these conditions that are challenging folks. So what we've been doing, and we're still in the middle of this, is we're kind of chipping through each of these conditions one at a time to try to better understand where across these landscapes, say ice conditions are changing and what are the biophysical mechanisms behind these changes in the ice. So in other words, why are the ice conditions say bad here, but not in other parts of the landscape? So we've done some nice work on that so far. So Dana Brown, one of the postdocs that helped out with this research, put out a paper recently uh, in Weather, Climate and Society looking at changing river ice seasonality and the impacts on interior Alaska communities. What she found by looking at how breakup uh, and freeze up is changing, it's strongly related to spring uh, and autumn air temperatures. Um, and the ultimate finding from this is really the duration of safe travel on ice is narrowing, especially during those shoulder seasons. Some of the environmental cues used in the past are uh, just not as useful um, now. Some of those cues are not working and people have some real anxiety and nervousness now about traveling across the ice. One thing I do want to point out is, is these conditions that we explore, they're being talked about on a daily basis in communities and households across the Alaska. If you'll do just a quick search in any of the newspapers in Alaska um, about ice and the dangers of it, you're going to see a lot of uh, tragic accidents being um, reported on a daily basis. For example, just two days ago, um, in one of the Northwestern communities, uh, 
a couple of adults and a child um, died after a snow machine traveled through the ice. So looking at these different ice conditions, using all the technology that we have to do so, um, is gonna be really important to the communities in Alaska, not just to uh, help them figure out how to adapt and plan to get out on the land of their hunting and fishing areas, but also just for safety reasons when they're traveling to and from different communities. The other thing that we're looking at is, is so we're, we're identifying that these conditions are, are affecting folks' ability to travel off, travel across the land, but we also wanna find out is it actually affecting harvest? Is it affecting their ability to fill their freezer? So another student of mine that's helping out, this is Tessa Hasbrook, she just graduated. She looked at how long-term changes in temperature, the timing of leaf drop and water levels are affecting moose harvest rates. So she used some remote sensing, some different uh, hydrological metrics, long-term weather data, and she compared that with 30 years of moose harvest data to find out how these different changes in the environment are affecting daily harvest rates in rural Alaska. I won't dig into the details on this, but again, this is something that folks are talking a lot about here in Alaska. Like this is a newspaper article just last year where in Western Alaska it was unseasonably warm in September and there was a very low moose harvest. And a lot of the manager areas speculated it was related to very warm temperatures where your bulls were just uh, not very active, not moving about and really tough to hunt. And we're also seeing proposals being submitted to the Board of Game who sets regulations in Alaska for potential changes in our regs to better align with these new normals that we're experiencing. But just some results from Tessa's work that is in review right now, she found that your local hunters were pretty resilient where only water levels were having a significant impact on their moose harvest. And it was during that September 16th to 20th. So during peak moose harvest, your non-local hunters, so those coming from urban areas, hunting in rural areas, were much more affected by temperature and water levels. Higher temperatures meant lower daily harvest, uh, lower water levels also meant lower daily harvest. So there's a snapshot of what we've been up to and where we're going next. Um, I know I don't have much time, but maybe I can field a couple questions. Thank you.